Okay, we're going to get started, uh, hopefully right on time. And um, as you know, thank you for being here early. We'll probably have some people roll in a little later just because of the habitual eight o'clock grand rounds. But um, this is our update, which is quarterly-ish. But this is a refractive surgery update, but really it has very little to do with refractive surgery, but has a lot to do with uh, probably more applicable um, anterior segment surgery and what you'll see in clinic and very common problems that people will come in with. Obviously, cataracts are super common and Dr. Hu's um, talk will, this, hopefully this can be a discussion. And I know with trainees here, please ask all of your questions. We, we'll have time, we can discuss some of these things and there's no such thing as a stupid question when it comes to this stuff. And then Dr. Kirschenbaum, our other fellow, wonderful fellow who's now working with me, will talk about a case and then also a discussion about presbyopia. Uh, well, I guess you're not talking about presbyopia today. She's gonna give you an update on the EVO ICL, which is, um, the ICL is an implantable lens for myopia and there's a new version of that and uh, she'll start that off with an interesting case. So. And now I'd like to introduce the wonderful Dr. Hu, and she's going to talk about um, refractive surgery implications in cataract surgery measurements. All right. So, yep. Hi, everyone. Yes. <laughs> everyone thinks, can everybody hear me okay? I'm projecting off my laptop because I used too fancy of a font, so it's going through me to Zoom. Now back to you. Um, so thanks everyone for coming in bright and early, at least bright and early for me, Dr. Mifflin. And uh, today I'm going to be uh, presenting a um, what can be a source of challenge and frustration for some cataract surgeons, which is um, the topic of post-refractive um, cataract surgery, or in other words, a day in the life of Dr. Mifflin's OR, and we'll be looking at some cases today. So um, I just remember last year as a chief resident, um, one of kind of the dreaded uh, things that I would experience as my on my VA rotation is getting some patient charts, maybe only a couple of days before surgery, doing a chart review, and then realizing that the patient not only had LASIK, maybe even worse, had hyperopic LASIK in the past, and the correct IOL preparations hadn't been made. Um, or even worse, I was supposed to be doing the calculations and I didn't know how. Um, and I didn't really have a good grasp on how to evaluate these patients and to see whether they had LASIK or PRK or maybe even RK in the past. And to be honest, looking back, uh, I, I don't think that these patients um, were really counseled uh, properly in a way that I like to review with you today. So uh, not unlike this screen face emoji, uh, I felt pretty apprehensive taking these cases on. Um, so we'll go through some of those concepts together. So the number of patients who are uh, now getting refractive surgery is on the rise. And of course, now we are increasingly facing uh, management of post-refractive um, uh, post patients, uh, especially in our surgical practices. And um, incisional and laser refractive surgery both affects IOL calculations. And um, determining the K values or the keratometry values and the power of post-refractive, um, the post-refractive surgery cornea is especially challenging and problematic um, for reasons that we will go over in just a bit. So um, for those who aren't familiar, there is an ASCRS uh, calculator. There are actually a set of calculators um, where you can actually input, um, input data for prior myopic LASIK or PRK, hyperopic LASIK or PRK, or prior RK. And um, this is what it looks like. Again, if you're not familiar with it, um, usually um, somebody will put in, uh, there's three devices that you technically need to put input the data for uh, these calculators. Um, some of them come from topography, uh, such as our Zeiss Atlas. Yes, Chiefs, you do need the Zeiss Atlas topography, so you have to go into the other room at the VA and make them turn it on. Um, and then for the Pentacam as well, as well as um, IOL uh, biometry, such as the IOL Master. Um, and actually, one of the um, founders and one of the um, one of the founders of um, many formulas and calculations, Warren Hill, he has said that for experienced surgeons, the accuracy of target within half a diopter of LASIK and PRK patients after cataract surgery is between 65 and 75 percent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, so yes, thank you, Dr. Mifflin. So we're doing pretty good overall, um, but today we'll go over some pitfalls and some challenges to look for. And then again, for those not as familiar, after you input the data, it will, it will actually spit out a couple, um, a few numbers actually just based on various calculations and various different formulas. Um, and we'll look at some examples, but pretty much as a surgeon, by the time you see this sheet, you're kind of looking more towards the bottom of the sheet where the, uh, where the numeric values first suggest the target are. All right, so again, how can you tell if someone has had a prior, a prior refractive surgery? So of course, a slit lamp can help with RK incisions and also LASIK, if you can maybe hallucinate that there's a LASIK flap there. But if somebody has had PRK, it's very difficult or near impossible to discern if they've had um, any um, prior surgery. So, um, so topography is definitely very, very helpful in seeing any ablation patterns. And not only helping you tell, or not only can you, can it help you tell what type of surgery they have, but what actually type of correction they've had, meaning either myopic or, or hyperopic. Um, so for example, this one is a myopic pattern. So for those who aren't familiar with topography, the warmer colors are, are steeper and the cooler colors are flatter. And you can also look at the numbers as well. So you can see this is a myopic pattern where it's flatter in the center um, and then previously steeper or steeper in the periphery. And then for a hyperopic pattern, it is um, the warmer colors are in the center. So it's steeper in the center and then flatter in the periphery um, as denoted by these cooler colors. Um, of course, other challenges can arise. People can have um, abnormal scarring or decentration of their ablation um, or irregular astigmatism. And so these aren't always clear cut examples. They can be a lot more subtle in findings. Um, but this one over here, you can see that this is a very gorgeously centered ablation, very uniform. Um, and I know that because it's actually my eye after I got PRK. <laughs> so um, from Dr. Colin, if one of our um, uh, one of our cornea fellows last year, and of course Dr. Mifflin. And then over here, the hyperopic pattern. Um, this is a pretty dramatic um, dramatic example for more for teaching purposes. But usually or typically, hyperopic ablations and corrections are lower power corrections, so the findings can be more subtle. Um, again, so why are these uh, why are these targets so unpredictable and seemingly so elusive, or they can be? Um, and why is there such a lack of precision when trying to achieve a target for these patients? So as I mentioned before, there are numerous formulas that have been developed to calculate IOL power for eyes that have undergone refractive surgery. However, each and every one of these is an estimate and not an exact calculation. So if you think about, for example, a patient with RK, after getting refractive surgery, the axial length is not, uh, is not affected by refractive surgery. However, determining the keratometric power in the post-refractive cornea, um, that is the biggest challenge. Um, this is because if you imagine that there's now a smaller effective um, central optical zone after uh, cataract surgery, um, especially after RK, this can lead to inaccurate measurements because keratometers and placido disc based imaging devices um, will take rings of, of measurements and um, sometimes not go quite as close to the center of the cornea and therefore underestimate the power of the central cornea. So you can imagine in this example for a um, for a post uh, for a myopic correction, um, it is underestimating the steepness of the central cornea because it is now more flat than would be in a typical cornea. So most um, generally most formulas in the traditional sense without any refractive considerations will tend to um, overestimate the power um, for overcorrection. And believe it or not, this was actually one of uh, a big topic and actually one that was very heavily emphasized on my um, our, our um, most recent written boards, unless I'm just biased from remembering that. Um, but uh, so, um, so hence somebody, you know, it's very, very understandable that people would be very apprehensive to maybe take on these cases. So. So we'll just go over some cases. So this is a history um, of a woman who came in. She had 16 cut RK in both eyes um, done 35 years ago. She had a, also had a history of monovision contact lenses. Um, and she also developed two plus cataracts. And um, this, is her, um, this is her topography. So you can see here again, um, myopic ablation or myopic correction from the RK. So excuse me, not ablation because she had RK. Um, the center is cooler, so flatter in the center and then steeper in the periphery in both eyes. You can see it's pretty uniform in terms of the, um, in terms of the pattern and then also, um, also uh, quite center in terms of the optical zone. So for this patient, um, we ended up uh, aiming distance in both eyes. And some surgeons will elect to um, 
to, to get IOL calculations and measurements in the morning and afternoon, just to see if there's any uh, sign of diurnal fluctuations. So up to 60% of patients will have a diurnal fluctuation where overnight the cornea swells and then, um, and then becomes flatter just based on their, because of the swelling of their incisions. Um, so they can have a hyperopic shift in the morning and then become more, more myopic during the day. Um, in this case, um, just again, if you're not familiar with IOL calculations, um, her keratometry values weren't significantly different from either AM or PM. Um, and you can just kind of take a look at the, we usually look at K1, K2, and then also um, the Delta K as well. But for her, it was not as significant. Um, and then again, this is that, uh, this is that sheet where uh, the ASCRS calculator, where we've inputted all these numbers and it's spit out based on these different formulas, um, a estimation or um, suggestion for target. And so a lot of surgeons will look at, you know, the minimum, the maximum, look if there's any clusters, look if there's any outliers. Um, and then sometimes um, others will be swayed by certain uh, formulas based on their past experience. Um, some of our biometrists will put in the holiday two, holiday two, true K, and then also Barrett uh, true K as well. But for this patient, we elected to choose 24 diopter lens in both eyes for a plano target. And then um, this was also something that, uh, that we had um, explained and counseled the patient as well. But um, so this is her pre-op manifest refraction. At week one in her left eye, she was seeing okay, um, but you can see that she was pretty hyperopic. This is also a known, um, a known um, very short-term or known short-term um, phenomenon after cataract surgery for patients who have had RK um, with the swelling of the incisions. And again, also the same concept as diurnal fluctuations, um, more swollen cornea and a more flat cornea um, with a hyperopic shift. So some of these hyperopic shifts can uh, last weeks to months. So just a lot of pre-counseling to the patient and a lot of, um, and a lot of um, counseling during their post-operative period as well, and also a lot of reassurance. So for post-op week one in the left eye, she had a hyperopic shift, as you can see. Um, and then for her right eye the first week, she was also hyperopic, a little bit less hyperopic in the left eye, and then trending downwards furthermore uh, at her post-op month or final post-op visit for um, the right eye, and then six weeks out in the left eye. Um, she was pretty much uh, pretty close to Plano, pretty emetropic. Um, and she was overall very, very happy with her surgery. She said that, um, again, endorsing diurnal fluctuations that we provide reassurance is normal. She said that she had blurry vision in the morning with clearing throughout the day, but her vision was very, very good around 2 p.m. So then just some pearls for RK patients. Um, cataract surgery, like I said, after, um, after RK induces short-term corneal swelling with flattening and hyperopic shift for weeks to months. Um, this is actually a cool kind of graph that I found from a study in 1994 where they studied some, um, uh, where they studied bio biological, um, biological, uh, a biological simulation uh, where they actually hydrated a radial keratotomy incisions with BSS and induced a 10 diopter change in the power of the cornea after 45 minutes, and then they dehydrated the cornea and it actually went back to its baseline. Um, but overall, cataract surgery in eyes with previous RK, um, they generally do have good outcomes. So a study, uh, one of the most recent studies done in China for post-RK cataract patients in 2016 showed that there was a significantly, um, there's a statistically significant um, improvement in, in their, in their uh, best, visual, uh, best visual acuity. Um, as well as the study also showed, um, this study actually also looked at 30 eyes um, with uh, RK ranging from eight, uh, eight cut to 16 cut and didn't find any significant difference between these. Uh, yes. Yeah, of course. So even if you nail their correction with a lot of side effects at this stage, they used to, but you know, that's one of the challenges with, um, I mean, even as the Chinese study showed, typically the acuity is improved with surgery if it's well done, partly because of putting in a more prolate IOL. We probably won't get into that, but or maybe you will. Uh, but anyway, paying attention to the aberration is super important. Go 
Yeah, exactly. So the so for those of you on Zoom, Dr. Barlow had asked a question on mm -hmm. construction for RK patients. So yeah, typically, if it's less RK incisions, you can go between the RK incisions and not have too much worry. I actually think for this patient with 16 cut RK, we did do a clear corneal incision because um, the incisions weren't so deep on the cornea. Um, but you can get into a lot of trouble if you have splayed um, or gaped incisions or leaky incisions. So many surgeons will um, also consider a scleral tunnel or at least a groove temporal um, incision. Thanks. I'll that. just comment also. Um, yeah, Catherine, like we've done a couple of these recently and depending on the cornea, uh, these myopes tend to have big cornea. So sometimes there is enough room to squeeze in between with a two millimeter incision. But as she mentioned, the RK incisions are uniform depth and they tend to shallow peripherally. So many times you can still make a short incision, put a suture in it. I can't remember the last time I did a scleral tunnel on a RK patient. I just do the clear corneal incision and then suture it if I need to. But you, it is true that sometimes you'll split uh, an incision peripherally and have to be prepared to suture it. And Dr. Lynn has a comment too. Yeah, I tend to be a little more conservative and I do do scleral um, tunnel incisions. And the more, most recent one I did was two months ago. Uh, I, think, I believe it was a 16 cut RK. Uh, I, there wasn't quite enough room and I actually made, ended up making not a scleral tunnel, but a limbal groove. So like a, almost like what we do for like a D sec incision. So like a limbal groove and then kind of grooved in with the keratome and that worked out really well. Great. All right. And then, um, so case two, this is um, a gentleman with hyperopic LASIK uh, many, many years ago, I believe by Dr. Mifflin. And then also he had LRIs or limbal relaxing incisions to correct astigmatism. Um, and then he also had a consecutive hyperopia or hyperopia, um, more regression from his uh, LASIK. Um, and so he also underwent conductive keratoplasty or CK uh, in 2014. So for those who aren't familiar, CK is where you actually take um, some radio, high radio frequency and it creates heat and you literally shrink the collagen around the peripheral cornea, thereby flattening the peripheral cornea and then relatively steepening the central uh, cornea. So it is FDA approved for um, mostly it's for before for presbyopia, but for low um, for low power corrections of hyperopia, and then of course he also developed cataracts. So this is his um, these are his this is his topography. As you can see, not as beautifully perfectly uniform, but still very centered in terms of the ablation and prior treatment. And you can tell that it's hyperopic again because it's steeper in the center and then cooler or flatter in the periphery. All right, and then these were his uh, calculations. So again. We chose just based on what we had previously talk, talked about, looked at all the numbers, saw, see if there's any outliers, see if there's any trends, averages, and we chose a 20, uh, 21 power, uh, 21 diopter power in both eyes. So um, he's currently, yes, yes, go ahead. Um, any comment on your choice of IOL of being, it looks like, is it an SA60 AT? Yeah, as opposed to um, some of the other IOLs we do. Yeah, exactly. So that was, I think, what Dr. Barlow was kind of maybe alluding to. But um, the SA60 AT has a negative sphericity, so it uh, it counteracts basically the sphere. The, the spherical aberration on this one is pretty close to zero. Yeah, it's actually quite significant. Yeah, so it is a spectrum. right. So with a negative spherical aberration, um, you Typically, especially in hyperopic patient or post uh, hyperopic correction patients, um, you would want to put in a lens with um, with a positive positive spherical aberration. Whereas for um, typically our other cataract uh, our other cataract patients, when they have a positive spherical aberration, um, people will put in a negative um, spherical a a spheric or negative sp uh, spherical lens. Is that yeah 
And then currently um, he is post-optic two in the right eye. And then this was actually his post-op day one um, visit. So he's doing pretty well. Um, he's really, really happy seeing that patients are, uh, sorry, he's saying that colors are amazing. But as you can see from his HPI, he was still wondering about a touch up for the left eye, um, kind of being his, his first day. Um, so again, just uh, we counsel our patients, we counsel our patients with Dr. Mifflin, he teaches them in clinic. And we also, uh, either he or the fellows or some of our technicians will actually call patients you know, leading up to their surgery and answer more questions, set expectations, set boundaries of what is possible. But you can see that still patients are always maybe expecting more despite what you've told them. Um, and so actually, as we had talked about this patient's ablation, I'm just gonna go back. This patient's ablation was pretty well centered, um, not as uniform as RK, but relatively uniform. But um, compare that with this patient. So this patient has a history of um, monovision LASIK correction with a very decentered ablation. Um, currently, this patient, he underwent cataract surgery in both eyes. Um, this is him actually a few months out. He's doing okay. He's not doing great. Um, you can see that his refraction is close to the target we wanted in terms of Plano in the right eye and then monovision in the left eye, but he's struggling. He can see pretty well at intermediate distance, um, but he's still struggling without glasses um, with up close and some distance, um, some distance vision. So as you can see, the more decentered, the more um, the more unpredictable the outcome can be, and so the more counseling, of course, and setting expectations for patients. Um, there's also another kind of interesting topography of another patient who has had PRK in both eyes. This, uh, I believe, this is an eye that has that still has a pterygium, as you can see, very very irregular. Um, and then also, this is another his other eye actually has had a pterygium removal and also PRK. So um, again, lots of counseling for this patient that. Uh, a lot of the uh, calculations that we do are estimates, but there's no guarantee in terms of glasses and spe uh, spectacle independence. All right, and then case number three, um, this is a patient with monovision LASIK. Um, she has really good near vision currently, um, but she is developing cataracts and has glares at night. And then um, we couldn't really tell, she was thinking it was myopic LASIK, but looking at her, um, looking at her topography. So if you look at the left eye, it does look more consistent with the myopic LASIK. Um, again, cooler colors in the middle, meaning it's more um, flat in the middle um, compared to steep in the periphery. But looking at her right eye, it's a little bit funny. It's a little bit more tricky. So it looks, there are some features of myopic ablation, but it looks almost more consistent with a hyperopic correction. Um, as you can see, it's more um, steep in the center, flat in the periphery, or maybe even more of a mixed astigmatism picture where they're myopic in one meridian and then um, hyperopic in another meridian. So what did we do for this patient? Um, we actually just got a ton of calculations, as you can see. So we got many, many sets of calculations for, <laughs> excuse me, for both myopic and hyperopic LASIK treatment, um, and then clustered and saw again with all the lens choices what the cluster was around. So for myopic LASIK, I believe, or myopic LASIK or PRK, I believe um, she clustered around 18.5 diopters, and for hyperopic LASIK correction. Um, she clustered around 17.5. So we split the difference um, and chose an 18.0 diopter lens. And we did choose an SA60 AT lens for uh, assuming that she had more of a hyperopic correction in the past. Um, and we did aim for kind of a um, more near intermediate target for her. And we did tell her, I remember distinctly that when Dr. Mifflin went to see her in the PACU or in the, in the pre-op area, he said, you know, it's kind of a fuzzy target. We're just going to aim for the best we can. But as we've talked about numerous times before, this may not be perfect. And so this is post-op week one so far. Um, she's actually, she's doing okay. She says she's just, she's adjusting to new vision. Cause as you remember, she did have, have a, she did have a history of monovision LASIK and had very good uh, J1 plus or 2020 near vision in that eye. Um, so she's adjusting to her new vision. She's more close to Plano than our minus 1.75 target. And she is um, not so happy that she's not able to read up close. So again, just kind of the variability and unpredictability of these types of ablations and these targets. I think it's All right, and then the last case. This one actually is um, a little bit of a um, a little bit of a, a jump off topic from pure refractive surgery, um, but we'll start actually backwards. So this is a patient who came in last week um, in January, post op week one, doing really really well, very happy with his vision. Um, we had a monovision target for him for his right eye uh, as near, and then his left eye as distance. 
And as you can see, he's doing really well, pretty much right on target. And so if we look at his topography currently, um, does anyone want to make any comments about it? Any, any residents want to make any comments about it? Any patterns you see? So some irregular-ish astigmatism, but overall pretty, actually a pretty good, um, pretty reasonable topography profile as a, in contrast to three months ago, um, this is what his same eye and the left eye looked like. Does anyone want to take a guess about what is going on here? So this is January, this is January, and this is uh, three months ago, four months ago. Yeah, very good, Abigail. So good. Um, so yes, he had a tertium. So you can see, oh, so sorry. You can actually see here that there is um, some profound flattening and then very irregular astigmatism, of course. Um, you can also see that in the plac uh, placido disc images. But yes, this corresponds to a pterygium that he had. So he actually presented in September with a three millimeter pterygium in the left eye. And so um, he came in uh, initially for a cataract evaluation. So um, topography was uh, was obtained, but we did counsel him that we may need to remove the pterygium if it was causing any um, induced astigmatism or irregular astigmatism. So we underwent uh, pterygium excision in October 22, 2022. And then three months later, we repeated biometry and also his topography. You can see that, um, that there was a huge difference just removing that pterygium from his eye. So also wanted to um, just take a look at his initial biometry. So this is our IOL master. Again, just attention drawn to a very large amount of astigmatism as uh, measured by the autom uh, automated keratometer in the uh, ILL master. Contrasting that with January 2023, you can see that he has almost no astigmatism. So just the importance of removing pterygium and setting your patient up for success and optimizing their cornea prior to cataract surgery. Um, I know Cole and I had kind of run into a similar situation where we had an outreach patient and it was actually at 4th Street and Dr. Lin was staffing us. This patient had a pretty large pterygium, very, very dense cataract. And as you know, with our outreach patients, it can kind of be difficult to schedule them consecutively for, for surgery and find OR time. And so the question was whether we should remove the pterygium or just do the cataract. Um, and of course, Dr. Lin um, correctly uh, had advised that we should definitely remove the cataract, sorry, definitely remove the pterygium first. Um, and same uh, situation where he had almost 11, or I think almost or 13 diopters of, of astigmatism. And then after we removed it, um, he was closer to, um, closer to Plano or closer to uh, no astigmatism. All right, and then again, this is also highlighted in his pentacam. As you can see, this is prior uh, with his pterygium and then also after pterygium excision. All right, so some key points um, are counsel, counsel, counsel your patient. As Dr. Mifflin said, you should teach, measure, uh, and then teach again, and then also be prepared to deal with the patient's unrealistic, uh, unrealistic expectations. Um, in terms of measurements, um, of course, topography, IOL, uh, biometry, and then also um, considering a pentacam as well to look for um, posterior float changes or posterior cornea changes. Um, when uh, Dr. Rifflin counsels patients, I really like when he uses the words or very specifically like there's a lack of precision in this process since you've had a prior refractive surgery and there's a lack of, lack of predictability with our resources and formulas currently available. Um, be wary of variables um, and pitfalls and limitations and also recognize that the two eyes do not always act the same. And Dr. Mifflin, do you have a comment? Is it on? Um, one thing too, I think is really helpful that I've started doing is just print out a color map and take that to the bedside or the chair side and just show the patient, hey, this is the shape of your eye. We're gonna do the best we can. And I, I think that really has helped me teach people that, hey, it's, you know, and then you have to explain, well, the lens is only coming a half a diopter and this is your astigmatism. You know, it's really helpful. I think that visual, uh, is helpful. You might want to look at the chats. Uh, oh, okay. While we're waiting, I just want to uh, introduce and welcome Terry Spencer, who's been back in town for a year and a half, two years. Um, he was one of our residents and came back here from South Dakota. Welcome, Terry. Um, another thing that I think when Dr. Mifflin says uh, that I think is very valuable is just um, do no harm and also speak the truth, not what the patient wants to hear even though sometimes they will hear what they want to hear. Again, just, I think the big takeaway from today is that a lot of these formulas, um, because you're plugging in many different variables from measurements that are inaccurate, 
those then can turn other formulations and calculations and ratios to be a little bit skewed. So anything on the cornea that is um, not uh, perfectly you know, symmetric, um, especially from a post-refractive uh, surgery, um, can just compound itself. And that's why we have such large ranges in a lot of these formulas when we do these calculations. So again, counsel, 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 that's kind of the biggest um, takeaway from today. Um, in terms of novel, um, in terms of novel technologies, uh, there is, let's see here, there is an intraoperative wavefront aberrometry device. I think we might have had it at the Moran maybe a few years ago. Um, and these systems have been shown to decrease residual refractive error in patients who have had refractive surgery. And um, basically it's um, intraoperative real-time aphakic IOL calculations. Um, and they can also be used to refine as, um, astigmatism with toric lenses. Um, however, there is debate about their utility with the use of newer generation IOL calculations and formulas. Um, but again, kind of a cool thing to think about. Um, so again, hopefully in conclusion, um, you're not as intimidated or have a better understanding about how to approach these patients, but you should not feel 100% confident because that does not exist. There's no guarantee. Um, but hopefully maybe you're feeling more like this emoji, this melting face emoji, you know, it's more of a fuzzy target, um, but hopefully with, you know, proper counseling and discussions with your patient, you and them can come to a melting, you know, kind of glob of satisfaction with the discussion that you're having. Um, so thank you again to, of course, Dr. Mifflin and the entire cornea team, as well as a shout out to our amazing um, biometrists here in the building. They make um, a huge difference in terms of counseling patients, and they're a huge resource for our patients. Um, and they do a lot in terms of helping us prepare our cases, but also, again, teach and, um, and counsel patients. So with that, these are my references. And <laughs> any questions? Yeah, these post lazy patients, this may be just a bias. Psychological bias post lazy patients are more likely to see a shift from the after relative to the person from the top. Anybody else has observed that or seen that? I don't recall really literature of anybody actually looking at that subject as opposed to version points would love to hear. I think it's, it's true. And, you know, these are formerly myopic eyes. So I, you know, I, I think if you looked at myopes or high myopes, you'd probably see the same thing. But yeah, it's messy data. And there are a lot of comorbidities and things like that. So it's hard to know. But I, I think that's true, Bill, especially for formerly myopic eyes. Um, just a comment, Dr. Barlow and I were talking before about aura, which is the intraoperative aberrometry and measurement. And I think most people kind of decided that it wasn't really that helpful because if it didn't correlate with your uh, biometry in clinic, then you didn't usually trust it. So it's kind of one of those things. But we need to move on to Dr. Kirschenbaum, and um, we'll try to answer the chats. Uh, on Dr. Who's computer while Davina's talking. Yeah, so there's a comment from Dr. La Rochelle, and um, we can just go ahead and switch to the um, to the screen. Um, she says, I struggle with patients with multiple enhancements and how to interpret their case. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Never mind. We were, yeah. As we can see, he has um, inferior steepening here in the right eye, and then of his left eye, even more a little bit. Um, he has inferior steepening in both eyes. So now looking at this um, abnormal tomography OU, so what are our options? And this is not an exhaustive list. Um, there are case reports of people doing many different combinations and different types of refractive surgeries, but um, these are the ones that we basically considered when deciding how to make this approach. Um, and so I'm just gonna go through them one by one. So first one, you know, saying this is too risky, let's not do anything for this patient. Um, the things that worked against this for this patient was that this is a highly motivated patient. He really wanted refractive surgery, and he's been seeing multiple people to look at this. Um, the next one is LASIK. So we're here to say don't choose LASIK in this patient. Um, so there actually is this study um, that I cited on the bottom by Buzzard um, that basically looked at doing um, LASIK even in stable, mild keratoconus patients, and three out of 16 patients um, needed to proceed to PK. So that's about 18%. So these patients, um, you know, this is the, any abnormal topography is the number one risk factor for post-LASIK ectasia. 
So we do not want to do that. Then PRK. So interestingly, PRK, another corneal ablation procedure, but actually these patients can do pretty well after PRK. Um, you're still, you know, removing cornea, but, and have an increased risk of corneal atasia, but these two other studies by, um, so the first one by Chalala, um, he had a five-year follow-up of PRK in 119 patients um, with mild to moderate keratoconus. And they actually found that near 70% of the patients had an uncorrected visual acuity of 2020 and only two eyes, which was 1.6%, had progression of disease at their five-year follow-up. So they did pretty well. Similar results also for the study by Gwedge, um, who also looked at a large number of patients with mild to moderate um, stable keratoconus and ended up having very good visual results. Um, the other things to consider is now we do cross-linking. So it doesn't have to be PRK alone. It can be PRK combined with cross-linking. And I'll kind of go into a little more detail about what that involves. Um, this is, of course, an off-label use of PRK. And also ICL, and that can also be with or without cross-linking. And this is another um, off-label use. And studies have actually, um, they have looked at using ICL in these uh, keratoconus patients and also have found uh, good results. So briefly, just to talk about, there's an option to do simultaneous cross-linking in PRK. Um, this was popularized as the name Athens Protocol. Um, but the main thing to really, um, I wanted to point out here, so... Basically, they did multiple, like a four steps to do um, cross-linking and PRK in a single session. Um, and for a little bit, there was a, little, a lot of hype that it improved top, uh, topography. But the problem with this study was that they really didn't have a control group. They just looked at how these patients did. And even in this study, they really didn't show much improvement in the visual acuity for these patients. Um, and a follow-up study by Iqbal done in 2019 basically showed that when they compared standard cross-linking with this like simultaneous with this uh, simultaneous cross-linking in PRK, the patients really had equivalent results um, in their visual acuity and their topography outcomes. So really, it was most likely the cross-linking result that they were seeing in this study. Um, the other option is to do sequential cross-linking with uh, topography-guided PRK, and um, this. Uh, when there was actually study, the study by um, Barden cited below actually compared this to PRK alone and even the simultaneous um, cross-linking in PRK that we discussed and showed that this has improved visual acuity and, um, and improved spherical equivalent. The, something very important is that there's increased predictability. When you wait between the two, you can actually get a more predictable refractive outcome when you wait to do the PRK. Um, there was decreased corneal astigmatism, um, decrease in the max K, the mean K, and the posterior astigmatism. And something that was really interesting in the study that compared the three is there was actually no progression seen at all in the group that had the cross-linking um, followed by the topo-guided PRK. Um, There's also a decrease in the total higher order aberrations and very high safety and efficacy indices. And of note, um, these safety, safety and efficacy indices were highest when the cross-linking was, cross was performed before the eczema laser with the period of waiting. Um, and the least high with PRK alone, um, as to be expected. The risks, there were seen to be um, an increased amount of corneal haze. We get some of that after cross-linking and after PRK, so it's not surprising by combining the two, there would be uh, an increase in that. Um, and then also as an aside, like a totally different thought process is, again, knowing we have cross-linking, you kind of have a, a safety mechanism or a rescue. So you can do the PRK and say, listen, if we do, if we do this PRK and then see that you do have some progression, we do have this option of turning to cross-linking. So switching gears, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the history of fake IOLs and kind of what brought us to this new update. So first beginning with anterior chamber fake IOLs in the 50s to 80s, um, this is pictured in this top picture over here. Um, so these, these lenses had angle support um, and did have complications associated with them, such as endothelial failure, corneal edema, ovalization of the pupil, and disruption of the iridocorneal angle. So because of this, basically in the 80s, they came out with um, a few other options, the first one being the lenses with iris enclavation, which is seen um, here in the bottom picture, uh, commonly known as the varus size was a big one. And that, that got FDA approval in 2004 to treat like minus five diopters to uh, minus 20 diopters of myopia. And then similarly, the posterior chamber fake at IOL. So this was really um, well liked because this basically increased the distance from the endothelium and the angle. So more safety um, looking at all those uh, complications that we discussed for the anterior chamber phacic IOLs. And basically the progression, you know, the IOL was first, um, the ICL was first approved, followed by the TORIC ICL. And now we basically all the waiting, waiting until 2022, the FDA finally approved the EVO here in the U.S. that was be, being used way before this outside the U.S. 
So the big, the big thing and why everyone makes a big deal about the EVO is that there's this central pore seen in the middle that basically facilitates the physiologic, physiologic flow of aqueous humor so that no PI is needed anymore. And what, so there's actually five basic pores in the EVO. So we have the one in the center, um, then the two other paracentral ones, and then two actually one in the leading haptic here and one in the trailing haptic. And what's cool about the pore is that, um, of course, it reduces the rates of pupillary block because you have that central hole. But what it also does is it makes this, um, having the aqueous flow behind the ICL actually causes this like cushion of aqueous to be between the ICL and the crystalline lens. Um, and what that's found is that that actually helps prevent um, cataract formation, which was another thing that we thought about with these ICLs. And um, but something to think about having a central pore in the center of any lens, there could be, or there has been seen to be increased aberrations with this. Um, so this lens, just to review, this actually starts from minus three diopters, a spherical equivalent, all the way to minus 20. So this could even be thought of as an option for patients with less um, myopia. Um, and for one to four diopters of astigmatism, uh, the interior chamber depth, of course, has to be greater than or equal to three millimeters. And something important to note is this is actually when it's measured from the corneal endothelium to the anterior surface of the crystal lens, crystalline lens. So um, you have to subtract the corneal thickness from the typical anterior chamber depth that you get from the um, biometries. And of course, we want to see um, the stable refractive history. So within half a diopter um, for one year prior to the implantation. So sizing, sizing becomes the really important thing with all this. And what we spend a lot of time looking at to pick the right lens for the patient. So um, there's four different sizes. And what these are, are they vary in the overall diameter and is what determines the vault, which is the distance between the ICL and the crystalline lens. Um, though there are four sizes, we typically use just the middle two. And how we do this is there's actually an online system um, that uses the corneal white to white, as well as the anterior chamber depth to calculate the appropriate vault. But we also use our own measurements as, you know, refractive surgery. We want all the measurements to kind of compare everything and choose the right option. So we use the UBN that um, measures the diameter of the ciliary sulcus as well. Some people use the OCT to look at the crystalline lens rise and the angle to angle distance. And just looking at a picture here of the UBM so we know what we're looking at. Um, so this top photo is basically like the ideal posterior chamber position after um, like the ideal vault after implantation here in the red circles is um, where the haptics are sitting and they're appropriately sit it, um, seated. In, pic in the photo B in the middle, um, this is patient with like barely any vault. Um, and then C is a um, photo of excessive vault when the ICL was in normal position. So even with the EVO, um, of course, any, any um, procedure we do, there are complications. Um, first being the refractive, the refractive outcome. So under correction, over correction, these patients will typically develop presbyopia a little bit earlier. Um, nighttimes, halos, and starbursts are a big one, as with other refractive um, surgeries that have to be discussed in advance. Um, increased IOP. So this is interesting. They did a study um, of 196 eyes, and they had one eye that had increased IOP in the EVO group, even with the central pore, and that was because a patient had excess inflammatory debris built up at the central pore. Um, and then cataract, again, we said there's a lot less cataract with the EVO, um, but it was seen in about 0.5% um, incidence in 619 eyes, but actually even that um, small amount of cataract, they were not visually significant in the studies. Um, and then as with any intraoperative procedure, infection and inflammation. So basically after reviewing all of these different things with the patient and what the best, um, obviously going through the risks and the benefits and choosing what the best option was for him, he chose to go ahead with the um, ICL. And so just kind of showing a little bit more about like what we used here to, to decide the correct fault. Um, so we have like a caliper also pictured on the left that we used to measure the white to white in the office. Um, so we took his measurements here. Um, we got the UBMs. As you can see here, he actually has a very large anterior chamber depth, um, which is great for the ICL, but something we want to consider is this patient was using toric ICL. So we just want to make sure that there's not too much rotation, which is something we were able to discuss with him. Um, biometry, um, really just pointing this out to show that luckily in this patient, which was nice, is the white to white um, was fairly consistent um, with the other measurements that just go hand in hand and making us feel more confident in choosing our vault size. Okay, so um, his surgery went well, luckily, and no complications. 
um, just looking at his post-operative visits. So we first looked at his like one week results um, for his right eye. He ended up um, 2015, his, um, his refraction was plano sphere. And then looking at his left eye, similarly at his one week visit um, and his right eye in the, in the second week visit, he remained 2015 OU um, with prescriptions being uh, plano sphere. So kind of just to summarize the main points that I wanted to bring to all of you to think about when we were like, even, you know, again, Catherine made the scary face emoji. So just kind of saying like, when we're approaching these patients, when they're asking us questions, um, sometimes we, you know, the initial response would be like, oh no, this patient has an irregular cornea. This, this um, you know, it should be an immediate no. But of course, depending on the patient, um, refractive surgery can still be an option as long as they understand their risks. Um, but in, in saying so, LASIK should never be the option because these patients will, um, their uh, ectasias and their keratoconus can progress. Um, PRK can actually be a safe option um, alone, but it's, it's nice that we even have cross-linking here. And again, we can even use the cross-linking as a rescue if need be. Um, and as can be seen, ICL is another safe and effective option that we can use for these patients that actually doesn't um, interfere with the cornea at all. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. I have a comment. So I think, um, so the topic of our grand rounds today is like updates in refractive surgery. Um, so I think with all the new technology, it doesn't really matter what it is, whether it's an IOL calculation formula, an instrument to measure aberometry or a device like the Evo ICL. I still want to just go back to, you know, informed consent, elective surgery, and cataract surgery has become more and more kind of like elective surgery and refractive surgery. So it's really, really important to just teach our patients and make sure that you truly don't fall into the trap of routine surgery becoming routine because it's only routine until it isn't. And about six weeks ago, I had my first complication from an ICL patient and um, went through our redundant and over-the-top measurements like we always do for this minus 10 person. And despite, you know, all of our predictions and calculators and everything, her lens was just extremely over-vaulted. And to the, to the extent that um, neither the patient nor I was confident in simply exchanging the lens, we just took it out a week later. And, you know, no complication. So again, I mean, she's been a very good sport and she's back in her contacts and, but you may get an outlier and when it's elective surgery, you know, you just need to really make sure that people understand pros and cons. Um, you know, we've had a rare, rare infection from LASIK or PRK. We have all probably seen or had complications in our IOL patients at this, at this point. So I guess just one final message is um, don't let routine surgery become routine in terms of teaching the patient and going over the pros and cons of the surgery before you do the surgery. When, um, when patients come in and I'm thinking we're going to do an ICL, probably the biggest part of my consent process is their visual aberrations after surgery. And so I tell them that 100% of them will have glare around lights at night. I tell them to 100% expect it. Um, the glare that you get with the Evo ICL seems to be a little bit different um, from the standard ICLs. When, when I think of the glare from a standard ICL, their pupil essentially kind of dilates a little bit beyond the optic. Um, and so they get kind of a peripheral area of their vision at night where it's not corrected. And so they're going to get kind of glare that is sort of like a broader light beam. Um, people with the Evo ICL are actually describing a central glare or a central aberration, meaning like in the center of their vision they're actually getting a little bit of a weirdness when they look at a light. And, and some people are thinking that's due to that central hole. Um, what I found after I started implanting the Evo ICL is it's actually pretty hard to center these lenses. Um, they're, they're really gummy and they just kind of sit where they want to. And so it can be kind of challenging to get that 
hole right in the center of their pupil, especially if you've got a toric component that you're trying to get lined up as well. And so it, it takes a little extra manipulation. You have to be super careful with how you manipulate these lenses to try to center it. But that's a, a distinct difference between this Evo ICL and the previous version of the ICL. Um, you can no longer order the previous version of the ICL. So if you want to do ICL surgery, you essentially have to use the Evo so you don't have another option. And while it gets rid of the need, in quotes, for um, peripheral iridotomies, there still are patients that get a little bit of a pupil block and still require a PI. So I still tell patients that we may have to rescue them with a, a little opening in their iris after surgery. So I usually clue in on that with an elevation in the pressure. Sometimes you'll, you'll figure out that they're getting a little bit of pupil block um, based on sort of vision complaints and, and weird glare issues. And sometimes I'll repeat the penicam and kind of see what their anterior chamber depth is doing. And sometimes you'll see a narrowing of that anterior chamber depth and they might need a peripheral iridotomy, so. Yeah, the ICL, if you see these EVO patients and you'll be able to see that the central hole really easily and at the slit lamp and it's almost always temporal. Um, the lens for most, most of them and a lot of these, if you don't know, the lens is put in with the haptics at the three and nine orientation and the toric lenses are designed to be used that way and they pretty much always sit temporal, I don't know. But one point I just wanted to make, the more broken somebody is, the more willing they are to put up with side effects. And you take your minus 15 patient and they have a little nighttime halo-ish thing and they're pretty happy typically. But again, just goes back to the whole informed consent thing and patient selection and preparing the patient for the expected outcome, which I agree with Brian. It's like pretty much 100% of those people are gonna have some aberrations in dim light or at night in my experience. Yeah, I agree. I haven't had any pupillary block issues, but I definitely have seen a little bit of shallowing of the um, the anterior chamber, but uh, I've, I've run into more issues with uh, glare from the prior version of the ICL with the PIs, patients having kind of horrible glare just from the PI itself. So it's nice to have to kind of trade that for maybe a less severe form of uh, dysphotopsia. Thank you.